Oh my goodness, good to be back. Dr. James, Dr. Mike. Dr. Mike's just waiting to grill me with something. I can tell he's got something up his sleeve. It's gonna put me to shame. Here is a riddle. What is weekly, but only occurs once every other week? <laughs> this is the, the RP weekly <laughs> webinar. The RP weekly webinar. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We suck. Somebody made a comment on uh, one of the things that was like, love the content, but this bi-weekly shit is, is bullshit or something like that. James, I love your haircut. Thanks. I got like the mad scientist Covino hair going again. It's just all over the fucking place. I would say you look sexy. Thank you. Furthermore, I would say that you're the kind of man that I would meet in a bar and think, geez, this guy is trouble, but I want trouble. Looking for trouble tonight, baby. Let's get 100%. it. Let's mm -hmm. get in trouble. We've gone to clubs like that before. Many. Many, many, many. I always tried to flirt with the gay men and the gay clubs, but they always know I'm straight. I, they have the I know. They see right through us. They see right through us. Yeah. No, get out of here. Oh, I've been called straight meat so many times. <laughs> it hurts. You hetero cis male normative guy yeah mm -hmm. some of those are redundant uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right shall we shall we shall we yes let's answer some questions let's do it first up is henrik anderson by the way the algorithm did a dog shit job of uh of organizing these like so there's going to be some skipped ones because like there's a bunch of like Ones with 18 upvotes that are like five pages down. And it's like, what's going on here? I don't know. That's crazy. All right. All right. Henrik Anderson asks, how would you go about massing slash cutting when calorie expenditure is vastly different every day? Gaining slash cutting usually results in me gaining body weight too quickly slash fast by quite a lot. I've been tracking calories for some time now, and I can't seem to estimate my energy accurately enough. Going by weekly averages don't really help me either, as my body weight tends to shift by quite a lot day to day. So... The weekly averages should help you if your body weight shifts day to day because it probably doesn't shift much week to week. So that is something I'd probably focus on a little bit. But anyway, uh, continuing on, do you have any tips or things I should consider doing so that I can reach my hypertrophy goals as efficiently as possible? Thanks a lot, advanced doc. So, I mean, just weekly averages and average weekly macros, I can't really recommend anything better than that because you said that you're gaining and cutting usual results in me gaining body weight too quickly or I guess losing body weight too quickly, then now that you know that, whatever like uh, surplus you want to impose or deficit you want to impose, just cut that shit by a third or cut it in half. Go from there. And then remember like a lot of these things, especially with mass gaining, happen in a very long term. And it's okay to be like even in a mild deficit a few weeks because you, you, are, you do have some preparatory hypertrophy and all this other stuff and recopping is going on early in the meso. So it's okay to sort of start on the easy side and then and catch a drift, or you could start on the hard side. Like let's say you gain body weight too quickly when you're massing, start at your normal surplus. And then when you've gained like three pounds in, in two weeks, which is too much in, in your case, you could reduce the surplus by a little bit. And then you're sort of know that you're in a good place. So I think the vastly different everyday calorie expenditures, I have a uh, pretty different the daily calorie expenditure. It doesn't bother me much because I just know that day to day, my body weights are going to be all kinds of weird shit. Let me put this in perspective. I currently weigh roughly on average 241 pounds per week. And I have some days where I wake up and I'm 247 and some days I'm 237 and other days I'm 236.4 and shit like that. So, I mean, 236.4, you wake up, you're like, okay, I clearly am not in deficit. Wake up at 247 and I'm like, okay, I'm clearly like the fattest man in the world. But a lot of that's just water weight stuff. And, you know, if I eat a lot, uh, one day and I have a lot of like junk food on my like, cheat day or whatever. I have like, um, it's like Friday and Saturday night, I have some cheat foods. Yeah, I'll wake up heavier. It's no big deal. But uh, the weekly average really does solve those problems for me, James. Yeah, actually, you kind of, it was a nice segue because what I was going to recommend, Heinrich, this you might be factoring in um, sort of like the initial water weight changes a little too heavily into your equations. So what I might do is um, as you are transitioning from cut to mass or vice versa, you might actually just kind of do like a very 
um, what you would normally do and just kind of let it cruise for one to two weeks and just let your body weight adjust. Cause you might just be like a big water shift person where you put on a lot of water weight and take a lot off when you make those transitions. So maybe give yourself like a one to two week kind of buffer period and then start um, more rigorously looking at those weekly averages and see if that helps. Because what I'm guessing is you might just be dumping and taking on a lot of water and that's causing your weekly numbers to look like they're skyrocketing a lot when really you're just kind of refilling or draining a little bit uh, as a result of your dietary changes. So maybe give yourself like a buffer period for water weight adjustments to normalize and then see if that helps. That That is another alternative. Beautiful. Real quick, um, Hado Haido asks, hey docs, um, I've recently started noticing some spots on my head where the hair seems to have thinned out. I've been considering taking finasteride, but what's holding me back is that I don't want to negatively affect my natural bodybuilding pursuits. It's just a message with the body's DHT levels. Do you guys know slash have an opinion on how it might affect bodybuilding? James might. I don't. But I will say that you need to find Broderick Chavez, Chavez's Team Evil GSP um, Instagram page, and especially his Facebook group and his pay site, uh, where all these questions will get answered for you because uh, all this hormone stuff is 100% up his alley. But James, unless you have something there to offer. I don't know anything specifically about finasteride. I do, I, I use Rogaine, which is a different, I forgot what the chemical name is. I forgot off the top of my head. They actually sell it. You can get like the, the Costco version too, which is what I do. Um, and that it, for me has had no no tangible effect on anything except it helped me keep my hair, which is great. Uh, but no no personal experience or knowledge on finasteride specifically. Yeah, the yeah, Broderick Chavez, Team Evil GSP, that's the stuff where to find all that. And if you join their Facebook group, um, a lot of the guys there are so knowledgeable that you don't even need Broderick to to weigh in. They'll just answer your questions for free. So, yeah. Solid. Okie dokie. Next up is killer content. That's a little arrogant, right? Ooh, I believe has zero posts on his YouTube, which is just funny. It's even funny. more arrogant. Yeah. Got it. All right. Killer content has a very good question. Cutting question, would it conserve my muscle if I stayed near minimum effective volume and two reps in reserve every step from the metal cycle or is there a benefit from going from MED to MRV and four RIR to zero IR instead? So um, I'll, I'll say this. So there's, there's an obvious benefit, which we've beaten to death. Right. Over and over. It's nice. But I will say this. Um, it's not, so if you could somehow stay at MEV, which actually is possible, um, and stay at two RIR, much less possible. We'll get to that in a bit. Could you do a fine job? Yes. Would you be missing out on the easy gains and easy muscle loss, low fatigue stuff of being as low as four RIR? Yes, you, you would miss out on that. So definitely something to be said there. Now, here's the problem. So you say, okay, well, okay, I got to just go from four to two. Sure. But then how do you know you're really at two RIR? And how do you know when you're overreached? You know, do you tell yourself, okay, it's time to deload when I'm my match progression system. I, I, I hit a slightly higher weight or slightly more reps, but I'm at one RIR now. Like, what, how sure are you is it one RIR? How sure are you about that? You can't be sure about it. Don't worry. You don't have to answer the question. The answer is no, we'll answer for you. One of the absolute best reasons, probably the most important reason that James and I advocate to pretty much every meso getting to something like zero RIR is to know that you have given it your all and to have a very hardline quantitative um, indicator that okay, your progression is over and you are officially overreached. Because a lot of times things can get real hard, especially on a deficit. You can feel super fucked up. And you can think there's that was one RIR. And then you get into your head and all of a sudden you do five more reps. And you're like, oh, fuck. I wasn't at two RIR this entire time. So yeah, start at four because those are super easy gains and super easy muscle maintenance. Um, and then progress and progress and progress slowly until you hit zero RAR or failure and can no longer progress for sure. And then you know you're giving it your all and you know you're in the right overload range because especially on a cut, general systemic fatigue and just perception of effort can make it seem like you're getting weaker or getting overreached when in fact you're actually not. So that's a thing. Um, James? Yeah. And so there there are major training benefits and potentially diet benefits from going from MEV to MRV. And one thing just to consider is like the goal of your, I think this question ultimately comes from like a position of like, can I like 
I feel like I'm being very diminutive and straw manning, but it sounds very much like, can I just do really easy training during my cut? And that's probably not going to be the best. It's not going to serve that mindset's not going to serve you the best. And I think that there are lots of, you know, longitudinal benefits of doing hard training, even under calorie deficit conditions that will manifest later on. So I do think that like the, uh, the notion of like, okay, I'm going to cut, I should try and just take uh, some really easy trainings, probably not going to serve you if you have like long-term training goals anyway, because you basically, if, you, if you're this far, you basically signed up for this shit for the rest of your life, more or less. So you might as well just get good at it. And the way that you get good at it is by going, going for it relatively hard. And the other thing is like, if you're a beginner to intermediate, which, you know, like I would say 90% of people are, um, you're probably still going to be getting some kind of recomposition or some kind of longitudinal hypertrophy down the road that might be manifesting later from the hard training. Although the hard training sucks during a cut, it still is serving a greater purpose down the road that you might not be aware of in the moment. So I do think it's a good idea to do that. Yeah. Next up, Alex Cahill. Got it. Docs, you're legendary. Love you, motherfuckers. <laughs> Quick question. I'm turning 40 and came to lifting from the bike, although I still commute to work on my bike. My 15 years of super committed recreational five to 6,000 miles per year. Wow. Mm. Cycling are behind me and I'm all in on hypertrophy with thanks to RP, absolutely great results. However, well, thank you so much. Uh, however, once a year, I still do a bicycle camping tour with two buddies. 200 or 300 miles over five days, non-negotiable has to happen because I am sexually involved with my friends. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I say that last part. Well, we can all read between the lines. Nothing wrong with that, by the way. In the weeks, James and I have been on a few camping trips, if you know what I mean. Um, in the weeks leading up to and following this year's trip in June, uh, and also inside the ride, what are the best practices for minimizing muscle loss? I ate a ton on the ride and slammed plenty of protein powder, but curious if you have other suggestions. Thanks. Um, my best suggestion is probably a little bit outside of what we may have thought I would say, but it is schedule your ride during the first part of your active rest phase and just uh, I can do it normally and you'll lose a little bit of muscle and it'll resensitize you like crazy to get it back and you'll get all of it back. And then some psychologically, it'll take you away from, uh, you know, any kind of like monotony because now you're riding the bike instead of lifting weights. It's nice. It's highly active. You can eat whatever you want. I would just say it's so easy to regain lost muscle if it's just from a several days trip. Um, I would just say it's not a big deal at all. And just, you know, eat plenty of protein. Don't stuff yourself um, with protein like crazy and don't do anything insane in training. Take it at the beginning of an active rest phase. I think you're fucking golden, James. No, that was the exact same route I was going to go. It's so five days, even though it's going to be like a highly active and potentially catabolic period, it's really just not enough time to really sh to, to make substantial losses in, in muscle mass. So as long as you're relatively body weight stable during that time and like the week after, I mean, I know you're probably going to drop some water weight and maybe not eat as best as you could, but as long as you're relatively body weight stable, I really can't imagine you having any major long-term impacts. And like Dr. Mike already said, you're going to resensitize and gain any lost muscle right back right away. And then you've had an awesome uh, active rest phase where you kind of broke up the monotony of your normal training stuff. You did something wacky and hot damn. When you come back, it's going to be easy gains for a little bit and you're going to look great. So I would just just not even fuss. Like Dr. Mike said, don't even fuss with it. Just do the trip. Enjoy it. And the only thing I would say is like, just don't lose a bunch of body weight. And so like Dr. Mike said, like eating plenty of protein is good, but like maybe don't think I have to overcompensate with protein because their calories are going to be uh, your energy expenditure is going to be so high from doing all that riding. You might just want to just slam as much calories as you can. And maybe protein might, um, you know, to a certain point might just be too sating and you might be like, Oh, I can't eat anymore. And now my right. body weight's going down. Yeah. So find a good balance there, you know, so obviously eat plenty of protein, but you also might rely more on some like liquids, goos, and just high calorie stuff at that point. And that's fine. As long as your body weight's not tanking, I think you're good to go. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. All right. Next up is our old friend from the RP Plus days, Bastian Imadi. Oh, it's been a while. It has. So he says, greetings, docs. Long time no see. It's me, Basim, but I have changed my name to Bastian since last. Dude, that's fucking sweet. Who the fuck changes your name? That's awesome. Yeah, right on. James, if you had to change your name to something, what would it be? 
Well, I kind of already did. So I used to go by uh, Jim or Jimmy back in the day. Well, that's what my family called me because that's my dad's name. And uh, when I got to like the age when I started working, you know, and all of my documents say James and everyone would be like, James or Jimmy. And I was finally just like, just call me James at this point. It's just, you know, because like you go to college or you go to you work and people want to know what your name is. And it's just easier. That was just like, just call me James. I don't give a shit. Yeah. So I, that, yeah. that was mine. That was mine. There you go. Or Jimbo. Fuck Jimbo. Jimbo over here. What do I call you? Jamo? Jamo. That's a good one. Your Australian nickname. Oh. So he says... Uh, hope you guys have been having nice lives so far. Mine's great. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm starting to be a dietitian now, and I'm hoping for an academic career in the far future. That's really awesome. That's really, really good to hear. Either way, onto my question about the rep slash weight beating or matching progression system. Maybe it's less of a question and more of me just wanting to juggle some thoughts with you guys, as the saying goes over here in Sweden. Yeah, so juggling thoughts is pretty cool and European. <laughs> but anyway, it's no big deal because this is Sweden and nothing's a big deal. Still haven't been to Sweden. Been to Scandinavian countries many times, but not Sweden. I heard in Sweden, if they if you look like you're on steroids, they just pull you aside and like potentially jail you for suspected steroid use, and they can drug test you. So, whoa, really? Who is not going to Sweden anytime soon? You feel me? Is that actually a thing? I believe so. I've had people from Sweden tell me that that actually happens. Whoa, trippy, it's scary. Uh, I like that Sweden has their priorities in order. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like look at this guy. Just lifting up to no good. Um, All right. Let's see. Now, let's say that I train six total sets of quads on Wednesday of week one. I do three sets of leg press, 150K for 15, 12, 8, followed by three sets of 100 kilogram squats for 10, 7, 6, all three are on. I didn't get as sore as I expected, so I increased week two's Wednesday's quad volume to eight divided equally into leg press and squats. Plan is to decrease my RIR to two by increasing the load of my leg press to 155, the matching week one's reps. However, the problem in my head appears when I think of the squat. Would a more appropriate RIR decrease be executed by maintaining weight and reps for the squat? Since one extra set and weight in the leg press has made me way more disrupted and pumped than last time. So on a relative and absolute level, my squats are already harder than the last time by the mechanism of being more disrupted from the leg press the last week without a necessary RIR decrease by rep or load. Therefore, will matching both weight and reps from last week's squats in this context lead to a two RIR? Or would you still recommend an increase just in case? My kind of argument is that uh, would be that generally my fitness level would still increase enough to warrant extra loading or extra reps in the squats, irrespective of how harder it is to squat after week two's leg press compared to week one. So great question. And I have actually a very easy, straightforward answer. You just got to try and see. And what you do is you get through the first four leg press sets as you uh, intimated, 155 kilos, great, great idea. You, you hit roughly one RIR and everything. And you're like, oh, that's really great. That's what I wanted. And then the when the squats come up, you warm up and you feel, see how you feel. If you feel like fucking golden, you're like, oh, fuck it. Let's just increase the load on the squats too because clearly my fitness adaptations are pretty fast. If your warm ups go mad and you're like, holy fuck, my quads are fucked up. Then go on the easy and safe side and your first set just make it 100 kilos for a set of 10 like it was last week. And now once you hit 10 reps, here's what you can do. You can sort of momentarily, like for a split second, stop and be like, am I at one or IR? And you should know, yes, or I'm really at zero, or man, I'm like at three or four, or I'm like at two. And if you're at two or IR, just to uh, 11, just add a rep. This is where rep addition is such an awesome tool. It, it, it is an awesome tool in many other contexts, but like you already have 100 loaded. It's on your back and you're doing the set. You can auto-regulate inside the set itself because load regulation just uh, regulates between sets. Rep regulation, you can do on the spot. You like stop for a sec, lock out. You're like, yeah, I can do a couple more. This is no big deal. Then you go to 11 instead of 10. And then boom. And then the next set, you treat as an independent set. Yes, seven is roughly your target, but you can go a little higher, a little lower and see how that compares. So, uh, and if you think, okay, wow, like 100K was way too easy, is the right answer to do 105K on the next two sets? Or three sets? Sure, that's a, a, totally an answer. You could do one of five for two sets and you're like, oh, this is catching up to me. You can go back down to 100. So there's tons and tons of ways, uh, different ways to skin this cat. Two things. One, um, 
at the end of the day, you just have to try and adjust on the fly to get the closest you can to RIR, match or beat as best as you can. And remember, it's match or beat. So matching is totally fine, totally fine, especially if, duh, you have tons of leg presses before, of course you're going to be more tired. If you match with more leg presses before you in the squat, you're not, not really matching. I mean, you're beating in some sense of like underlying physiology is, is, is more adept. Uh, and, and two, remember when you skin a cat, either way, it's absolutely the worst possible thing for the cat. Because, you know, Jesus Christ, he's getting skin. Wow, it's terrible. Uh, yeah, really good answer. I, will, I would add too that um, the reason why the, you know, match or beat system works really well is because it assumes that the whatever progressions that you're taking, whether it's reps, load, RIR, or some, some combination of all of those things, are... I don't want to say relatively small, but within kind of the ballpark of what you should be doing, yeah. where, where you're going to find problems in the subsequent exercise, kind of in this case, like, okay, well, if I pump up my leg press, is that really going to take my squats out of this or that? That's probably an indicator that your jump was really large. And maybe you're on track now in terms of the rep ranges, RIRs and stuff that you were shooting for, but you were probably underdoing it before, which then has kind of like dissimilar conditions across sessions, right? So the reason why match or beat works is because the fatigue conditions regardless should be pretty similar. So if you do find that you can increase your, uh, like let's say you, you go up by 10 kilos in your leg press, well, that's probably a good indicator that you gain some fitness and correspondingly, you probably gain fitness on the subsequent exercise as well. So it should be roughly the same. Now, if you take like a 50 kilogram jump on your leg press, right? And you're like, hey, that, that was too IR, great. Well, yeah, now your next exercise is gonna be fucked because it's so different. So match or beat works when the conditions are pretty much much the same and your progressions are like, you know, maybe you increased your reps by one to two, maybe you increased the load by two and a half to five kilograms and yeah. you went from, you know, RIR three to RIR two, those, those types of progressions. If it's more than that, then you might find that yes, in the subsequent exercises, you might have to reevaluate some of those things and auto-regulate a little bit. And you can really just keep the, if this, if you do four back exercises in, in one session, which James and I probably say is too many, but it can be done your fourth back exercise may actually have the same load and reps every single fucking time, the entire meso, but because you increase sets and decrease RIR so much for the first three exercises, that relatively becomes much more of a challenge. Totally fine to do. Yep. All right. Oh, sorry. And run real quick, theoretically, because I think you guys would be interested in this. Uh, we hear a common retort of like, yeah, but what if you get so tired from your first few exercises or sets you have to like reduce the load and stuff on the last ones. How does that do the match rep? That's one of the reasons that why we train multiple sessions per week um, and, and, and try not to do any more than like 10 or 12 sets per session per muscle group. Because you're getting so fucking tired that you're getting weaker towards the end of your exercises. You have to ask yourself, not just the question of, is this a tracking problem? It totally is. The, the biggest question is, is this an overload problem? And it absolutely is. It's like, if you're weaker than ever, because you're so fucking tired, why are you still in the gym? What is it that you think you're doing? That's literally junk volume at that point. Yeah. So you have like the junk volume in terms of like the, within the same session, but you also might be having like an SFR issue too, where you might say like, okay, well, this exercise is good. Deadlift is the classic example where you're like, okay, I'm going to do deadlift. And then you can't do anything else the rest yeah. of the session, right? Like, okay, well, could I have actually just done three different exercises and gotten way more out of it? Or can I just do deadlifts and then a bunch of junk volume afterwards? Like classic yeah. example. Yeah. All right. Next up is J R letter J letter R split by split. Got it. What are your thoughts on a strength specific lower body slash hypertrophy specific upper body routine? I have zero desire to grow my legs, just want to get stronger on squats and deads, and have zero desire to get much stronger in my upper body lifts, only one size. I was going to say it's pretty good manly priorities, right? Um, also, I would just enjoy training much more this way. Any tips on programming this? Man, not really. You know, if you do, do your intelligent programming, um, and, and I, I would probably include like, deadlifts if you do them i would include them as lower body at that point um then you know you could just treat them as, as really quite independent and you just do strength program for your lower body hypertrophy program for your upper body and there's you know there's some systemic disruption interference but not much and uh, generally speaking you what you i would say the number one thing you want to keep in mind is um putting your leg stuff probably first and also keeping um, a lot of uh, spinal erector work uh, in your upper body, like lots of rowing and stuff 
from being like the session before you go do heavy legs because then your axial abilities, your, your ability to stay upright uh, and, and have a flat back are really deteriorated. Uh, so you don't want to do like tons of bent rows Monday, then go do your strength leg workout Tuesday. If anything, you'd want it the other way around or take a break and do Monday, Wednesday or something like that if you're going to be doing back. Maybe Monday you do heavy legs. Tuesday you do have a push, which doesn't really interfere with anything. And then Wednesday you do your hypertrophy, uh, or sorry, hypertrophy push. And then Wednesday you do your hypertrophy back work. That way it doesn't really interfere with a whole bunch of stuff. So maybe think of something like that. That's the only real tip I have. Other than that, I mean, it's totally, totally good to go. Yeah, and like the only the only thing where it gets slightly more complicated is if you're to, if to make a decision whether you basically just want to train your legs at MV and do you know relatively hypertrophy style lifting like five to ten reps or something like that, or if you actually want to be hitting like an MEV MAV for strength on the legs, which is a slightly more complicated issue because then you actually have to factor in like progressions and intensity and things like that, which is then going to have more compromise and spill over onto your upper body lifting as well. So it's just something to think about. It's not a right or wrong thing. You could easily just train your legs roughly at MV and you'll have like a really high state of preparedness and you can make some very marginal gains in strength over time, which is sounds kind of like what you're, you'd be happy with. Or if you want to actually make like tangible gains in strength in the legs, you might be actually looking at more like an MEV levels for strength and then the progressions that follow accordingly. So just think about that and think of the trade-offs that you want to make in terms of upper body growth and lower body strength development. All right. Next up, Ghostbuster sign, Lucas Johnson. Ghostbusters. Oh, he does have a Ghostbuster sign. I figured I'd say that. It's much easier to find. Yeah. What are your thoughts on microloading? For instance, add 1.25 pound plates to my bench on each side every time. I increase weight instead of 2.5s on each side, and I find it helps me maximize progress without shocking my body so much that I'm still sore from my next workout. Lucas, I think that is a phenomenal idea. The only downside of it is if you train at a commercial gym, you might have to carry the magnet plates in your bag, and that's kind of fucking annoying. You might forget one at some point, and then it got stolen or some shit. But other than that, man, microloading is fucking awesome. If you want some really good articles on it, uh, Google microloading Mano Henselman's. He has all sorts of really great recommendations on how to do things. It's fucking sweet. It's not magic. And a lot of times it's just the realistic amount of load you can put on the bar. So people that are more advanced, or if you have dumbbells, for example, like motherfucker, you, you know, other than adding reps, you're not going from the 15s to the 20s in one fucking microcycle. You might go from the 15s to the 16.25s to the 17.5s and so on and so forth. And, that, and that's actually very rational progression. So it's totally, totally fine. And people say like, you fucking bush, like just go up another plate. Those people are mindless animals. Yeah. And I actually think the calling it micro loading is, makes it sound diminutive. That's just right. loading. That's just like a more optimal way of loading, right? Like, and uh, weightlifting is a really great example of this because they use, they call it uh, change plates, right? But they got the little yeah. teeny little, you, if you've never been into a weightlifting gym, they have these like little teeny tiny little plates and they put it on there, but who gives a fuck, right? The whole point is to train at the loads that you're capable of, of, achie uh, of achieving overload at whatever you're training, right? So it's like, if you need one, if you just need another one pound, like, Add one pound. That's fine. I don't see why that's even a question. Like it's not, not insulting the question er, but like, it's not, a, it's not a weird thing. It's like, if you just need to go up by one pound, go up by one pound or two pounds or whatever. I think it's great. Yeah. You know, the you, just, that... you call it micro loading. So then people are like, Oh, micro penis, right? Come on. That's lame. <laughs> You're like, what? Uh, that's good. Yeah. No, I think yeah. it's totally fine. Yeah, there's a lot of weird shit that people shy away from because it's like not manly or whatever. I actually know people that um, really only deal in 45s and occasionally 25s, you know? Like they'll do bench and they'll just do like, if they're feeling not so good, they'll do 350. Oh. And if they're feeling great, they'll do 365. If they're feeling dumb, they'll do 405. And it's like, you know, like don't pat yourself on the back too hard for being a fucking moron. Yeah, I actually have a couple clients who had like a home gym set up that was literally like they had like a bar and like a 40 and two 45s. And I was like, oh, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll do something here. I don't we'll know. Do something. We're going to do a lot of repetitions. Yeah. <laughs> All right. A little bit more of a controversial question from oh. our friend, Fake Natty, who oh. I heard isn't actually drug free. Weird. Yeah. Some funny ass names. Fabulous Toaster. Fabulous <laughs> Toaster. <laughs> okay right. big natty got it 
What are your thoughts on front squats for hypertrophy? I don't mm -hmm. see them performed or even mentioned much by the RP crew. Is it purely a preference thing or do you actually consider them inferior for this purpose to other squatting variations? As a side note, Dr. Feigenbaum in one of his recent articles argued that whether one does high bar, low bar or front squat is almost irrelevant outside of sports specific context. I suspect he draws a bit too bold of conclusions from the studies he cites here, but my lack of knowledge uh, unables me to challenge them in a meaningful way, link to the article below. So, so yeah. I mean, so that that last note, I mean, you, that is just completely answered by SFR at that point, right? You can just you can just use that to answer. Should I do these exercise variations for whatever goal? SFR, boom, done. Like, yeah, pretty easy. So let's expand on that. We'll, we'll answer that second question first, and then the, the first question second. So, uh, our, Dr. Feigenbaum argued that whether one does high bar, low bar, front squats is almost irrelevant outside of sports specific context. Well, so the thing is hypertrophy is a sports specific context. Uh, this also upsets me, but I'm gonna try to be a little bit more polite than, than James is uh, uh, losing his mind over there. James, I feel you 100%. I actually think sport, sport specific is less relevant in those. Cause you could say like, <laughs> that's true. as long as you're doing like a triple extension or a hip extension, knee extension, like you could, yeah. that, you, I think it's less relevant in that case. Yeah. Sure. So I think maybe to steel man uh, Jordan's position there, Dr. Feigenbaum's, I think he's saying like, if you do weightlifting, you do high bar and front squat. And if you do powerlifting, you should do low bar, which is absolutely correct. That is definitely true. The thing is in the sport of bodybuilding, well, we care about the hypertrophy SFR a whole lot. And what you have to do is find which one of those has the highest SFR, which one has the SFR that is so low that it's not even a candidate for your selection of exercises. And there can be a lot of right and wrong answers specifically. Um, a huge, vast number of people that try to low bar for reps find that it fatigues the fuck out of their posterior chain, especially their back. It bothers the shit out of their shoulders or elbows or wrists or hips. You just kind of pick one. And the stimulus to the quads is good. But remember, stimulus to fatigue ratio, the fatigue is fucking massive. And the stimulus is like, meh, it's fine. So a lot of times people who have low bar squatter for a long time for hypertrophy, when they switch to high bar, they're like, oh my fucking God, nothing hurts anymore. And my quads are getting at least as good of a workout. So that's a huge win. That's why squatting low bar for most people for hypertrophy pursuits is just not a good idea because of SFR, like James said. Secondly, front squats. Actually, we can answer both these questions at the same time. The problem with front squats is twofold in bodybuilding. One is they tend to be a relatively unstable movement in the sense that you can't produce very high repetitive forces because the bar moves around a lot and it actually starts to slip off your shoulders. So problem one, it's not the best way to apply high degree of tension. Uh, weightlifters do back squats to strengthen their legs. They do front squats in order to get better at the front squatting position, which is a part of the sport. So even weightlifters don't use front squats to get legs stronger or bigger. They use high bar squats for that. Otherwise, the fuck are they a high bar squat for? So second problem, uh, this is not one that uh, involves um, weightlifting because weightlifting, the guys don't ever squat for, you know, front squats, they don't ever really do for any more than five reps, which is exactly what you would never need to. Um, in bodybuilding, hypertrophy work, you will do sets of at least five to 10, often 10 to 15 in the squat. The front squat will choke you to death if you try to do that. It does it actually in two ways. One, if you have a really good rack position and you're staying upright, it physically chokes you by fucking pushing into your goddamn airway. Second, if you don't have a good rack position and you let your shoulders go down, it starts to crush your rib cage and you can't take in as much air as you want because you're fucking going like this the whole time. It's dog shit. And a lot of people who have really pushed themselves in training in the quad movements find that they could just do so much more with the high bar squat and deliver so much more stimulus to the quads with so few other limiting factors than front squats, which is why for most people, not all, front squats are just not that great of a choice, which is, takes us back to the idea that all of those three high bar squats for almost everyone in hypertrophy are just dominant. Yeah, very good answer. So I think there are some people that, that are just built in a, such a way that front squats is, good, is great for them and that's fine. What I have found, and this is just my own anecdote, so take it or leave it, but I, I think that uh, front squats tend to be great for beginners and intermediates to some point, but usually once you get strong enough uh, to the point where you start running into these problems, right, that, that, then it just becomes less and less, excuse me, the SFR goes down over time. So kind of the, the TLDR version is like, it works great until you get strong. And then once you're strong, you're like, fuck this. I can't like, it's, I just can't train this way anymore. Same problem with like deadlifts and stuff. Um, 
so I used to do a lot of front squats myself until I would find that like doing sets of like 275 for eight or, you know, 300 ish would just be soul crushing. Right. And I would leave me just, I remember a couple of times at temple, I did a front squat workout for my peak week. And I remember I got through my heavy sets and I was just instantly overreached. And I was trying to tough guy my way out of it. And I was just like, uh, Nope, I'm going to do my down sets. I had four more down sets to do. And it was just one of those like comical moments where I went for the down sets and I was like, I'm, I'm literally overreached everywhere. There's nothing I can, I can't yeah. even do like a lateral raise at this point. I'm done. Yeah. I'm done. Like for the week I had to, I had to auto regulate a deload. Like, so front squats, just one of those that like uh, to a point it's useful. And then it, I, I kind of think around that intermediate stage, the SFR just really starts to tank. Absolutely. All right. Next up is Tuomas who has a seagull Almost. as his avatar. Let's see. Oh, got it. <laughs> this is All right. He says, hi, docs. What is your stance on doing exercises that are heavily spinal loading, such as squats during a morning workout? I've read about the fact that after waking, you have more spinal fluid in your discs that might cause problems if load were to be added on top of that. Should this be taken into consideration when planning only morning <laughs> workouts? <laughs> this is a funny question. <laughs> yeah. James, why don't you, why don't you start on this one? Um, so I, you know, I don't really have a ton to comment on that specifically. I think it's more of a practical issue is just of like, when are you going to work out? When does it fit your schedule? That's just where you go from that point on, you know, there is like, it, it is documented that people do grow and shrink a little bit throughout the day. And after you sleep, you kind of elongate out like to a very small marginal extent. Like if you've ever, and this, you, you can do this little experiment for yourself in the car, look at where your rear view mirror starts and then take, you know, at the end of the day or the next day, look at it again. And it's usually off a little bit. Why? Because you literally just moved around just a little bit. So there is some truth to that. Should that influence your decision to do heavy spinal loading? No, I think if you're going to work out, you're going to choose to do that or not. And when you do it is dependent on your schedule and you just go from there. I don't think you have to give this any specific consideration. Yeah. Sometimes if you wake up in the morning, some people kind of have like a loose SI joint thing going on. Lower back feels kind of loose and it feels weird to load it. Uh, warming up really just does away with most of it, but sometimes you might actually feel a little bit better training later. Other people, when they train later, their lower back already has a little bit of fatigue and kind of wear and tear from the day and then just really just does fatigue. And, and then later in the day, they don't feel so good in their lumbar region and they prefer actually to train early in the morning. I will say that like one thing I, I wouldn't do is go heavy on the axial loading movements after getting out of a long car ride or plane ride because sometimes your back is in an interesting position mildly inflamed in those relevant areas and then you majorly inflame them after with training and then everything goes to hell so that's something to keep uh, in mind but most of the stuff is really obviated quite well by um uh, by warming up man i've made that mistake before oh Dude, boy i fucking took myself out of training heavy for months by fucking getting out of a nine-hour car ride and then doing heavy squats and i was like i was convinced i had herniated a disc i didn't but that shit was irritated <laughs> as fuck it was bad and then sometimes you just feel weak as fuck too you're just like what is happening today yeah. why do i suck so bad it's just how it goes good advice next up is andrew atkinson man that thing is all over the place today huh got it crazy Andrew says, hi, docs. How often should one switch up their split? In other words, the order of exercises on a day or the order each day goes in the week or the weekly layout. I know it's a good idea to change exercise variation every few months, whereas they get stale. But what about weekly split? Also considering things like frequency, et cetera, how long would you say is enough time to give things um, to assess how well it's going? Thanks, as always, for the great contact for, from your very English friend. Yeah, last time I made jokes at his expense for how English Andrew Atkinson really was as a man. It is. Oh man. Uh, there was a fighter uh, this weekend, Davy, Davy something. He had like one of the most gnarly accents I've ever heard. Uh, I can't remember his name, I, oh, man, but he got on the mic and you were just like, what, what? <laughs> when you nod, huh? you speak English, but nobody understands what you're saying. Yeah. Oh man. All right. So really good question here, Andrew, a couple of things. First, uh, to quote, you know, the Saiyan saga in Dragon Ball Z, you know, the ascension occurs from a need, not a desire. And in that sense, you know, you have to have a good reason to change your split, which can include, 
You're just bored and want to change things up. Just don't expect any magical results from that as long as the split you change to is also uh, effective foundationally, like you're not doing anything crazy wrong, then you're good to go. But really you have to have a good reason. Here's an example of a reason. You were prioritizing your back for a while and you usually train chest and back on the same days, so let's say Monday and Thursday. So you were doing uh, back first. And now after a few months, your back growth is really good. You want to prioritize your chest. You start doing chest first. Like that's an example of uh, alternating it, but for a reason, because you want to prioritize your chest uh, and not your back. And also you could just get really um, uh, like stale uh, with that kind of split. And, and maybe you want to change things up. So uh, that's the first thing. And then second, it says how long is enough time to give things uh, a go to assess how well it's going, uh, considering things like frequency, et cetera. I would say you should have an average frequency that's roughly the same for a few measures in a row. A block is a really good way to evaluate it. So you do a block of 2x a week, a block of 3x a week, a block of 4x a week, see how those go and you find, okay, 4x a week is not sustainable for a block, 2x a week is great, but I can push it a bit harder, 3x seems really awesome, then you may actually end up with your next block being meso 1 is 2x a week, meso 2 is 3x a week, meso 4 is 4x a week, maybe, or not, or you say 4, 4x is just too much anyway, so I go 2, 3, 3, and then I do my active rest or do my maintenance or something. And then you figure that out. But I would say multiple mesos strung together a block really gives you insight on what you think is working and how well it's working. Yeah, really good insight there. Um, I would say in terms of like weekly uh, layout, aside from trial and error, like you should you should definitely play around with things and see what works well, as Dr. Mike was just saying. Um, but once you find one that works well for you, like for me, uh, example, I do like the six day split where it's like push legs, pull, push legs, pull. That works for me. And I just always do that. Now it'll get a little bit of variation if I, if I, you know, uh, periodize my frequency a little bit, but the nuts and bolts are basically the same where it's like, okay, I'm going to do chest three days a week, mostly in this pattern with the exception of maybe one meso, I might have a fourth chest day or something like that. I do legs twice a week, maybe a third time per week. Uh, you know, so it's kind of one of those things where it's like, once you find what works for you, keep doing it until it stops working for you. Because at some point your training age might dictate that you do make some changes and you might find that like, okay, this is uh was working really good for me. And now I can't train my legs three times a week anymore. I might have to cut it back down to two because I've gotten really strong. Great. There's, as Mike said, there's the need to reevaluate your training split. Um, but if it's working for you, like I, like I said, I've been running the six day split years at this point, and it gets changed time from time to time because we go on vacation or we travel for work or I take some active rest or I do some frequency periodization, but the gist of it is mostly the same. So there's no no huge incentive to, uh, as, this, as the saying goes, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. 100%. Yeah. All right. Last for today, we had 11 questions because the one on uh, finasteride and hair growth, James and I didn't know, so we don't count that. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, Wimabi. Oh, holy schmauzow. Yeah. Question here is, how much time does it take to see gains if you're doing things right? A month, preparatory gains with a Z, maybe two. If you don't see gains in that time, it's time to fix something. What would be the things you would look for first? So mm -hmm. we actually have a section in our hypertrophy book, which is highly recommended, of like things you can do to track your gains because seeing gains is sometimes really hard. Um, it can take like a year for you to see physical changes in your body if you're not so used to looking at your body or if you're pretty advanced. But there are really good proxies. One is, and this is the easiest one, rep strength improvement on the exercises you're doing. Look, if you're slapping on an extra 25 pounds a month to your leg press for three months, Motherfucker, you're making some gains and it's just not coming out of nowhere, right? Another one is, do you have a goal body weight and are you on your way to reaching it? If you weighed 150 pounds to start, six months later, you want to weigh 160 or 165. If you're four months in and you weigh like 157, 158, hey, you're doing real great. If you're four months in and you still weigh 150 and you're no stronger and you look the same in the mirror, <laughs> gee, you know, you got a problem. So to answer your question of how much time does it take to see gains, Depends on the magnitude of the gains, but really within one mesocycle, you should look back on that meso and be like, dude, that was really productive. At least you should be able to say, I got stronger for reps. And then if you can say that and you maybe gained a pound or two, hey, you're well on your way. Uh, or if you recomped a little bit and you kind of look a little tighter, but you're stronger for reps, that's really the kicker. So 
a mesocycle, a mesocycle, uh, you know, two, one to two months, however long your meso takes you, um, especially like after the deload, you should be like notably stronger for reps in the same exercise. And you're like, oh, well, I couldn't do this last month. Then, you know, you're onto something. And if that's not the case, yeah, then it's time to fix something. James? Yeah, really good. And I think this kind of gives credence as to why we put so much emphasis on performance, because performance tends to factor in all of these different things and gives you like a very good middle ground of what's going on. So on the one hand, like how long does it take to see gains? Well, you might see gains like the next day if you're relatively untrained because you're building neural efficiency, you're building work capacity, yeah. you're gaining strength, right? You're not even really touching any muscle mass yet, but you're still making performance gains, which at the very least is setting you up for gains later on, right? So maybe you're a slow gainer, maybe you're just more of a slow twitch person, you're not going to put on gobs of muscle mass. There's all sorts of different factors that go into it. So you kind of have to keep in mind, like gaining muscle, even in the best case scenarios, is going to take a while. It's or for, for at least for you to notice that you've gained muscle. Whereas performance is something that is a good indicator of like underlying changes that are indicative of things like muscle gain, or at the very least, if you're getting stronger, your training is at least going pretty well. So that's like a good kind of middle ground where if you if you've noticed that your performance is increasing, you're not fucking up, right? You're not doing anything sure. bad. That's kind of like the, the good news there in terms of like, how long does it take to see gains? Like you, you all have those friends who they, they basically coach Tim, coach fucking Tim. Yeah. He, he'll just him. like, he'll just do like two snatches and eat a pizza. And he looks like Thor for no fucking reason. Right. Whereas like your yeah. boy over here spends years and years and years with Gumby man syndrome. And I still don't have arms that are impressive. Right. It sucks. Right. It's just, yeah. So uh, everybody's a little bit different. Um, so keep that in mind, but that's why we tend to lean on performance because if you're getting stronger at the very least, you're making neurological changes that could be yeah. potentiating muscle gains. At the very least you're making work capacity related changes on the yeah. muscle that could be leading to performance gains. And in the best case scenario, you're actually getting muscle. So yeah. boom. Yeah. And then after a few months, especially if you're a beginner, your body should look a little different. Now, now here's the thing. That involves psychology. Rep strength tracking does not. Body weight does not. Like either 160 or 165, okay? You either got some strength or you didn't. Some people look at their body and they're like, I don't feel like I'm changing. And everyone around them is like, dude, you're a fucking animal. You've, it's night and day. And they're like, I don't know, I don't know. And some people are like, dude, I think I like fucking better. And you're like, dude, you look the fucking same. You might look worse. So the, the mirror right, is a good tool, but complementary <laughs> to the other things, especially rep strength changes. Yeah. yeah. And so like having some combination of like objective measures, in this case, performance and subjective measures, like how you look in the mirror, it's probably a good place to start. Boom. That's it. Sorry, I had to move around so much. I, uh, you're in a, you're in like a very seductive pose right now. You're like an evening with Dr. Mike. Hello, welcome. Ooh, mummy. You got like a bottle of wine. We just need like a fire, like a flickering firelight in the background. Then we'll Ooh, really I could light my bed on fire. Oh, Is that the same? <laughs> Please don't do that. No, no. Please no. don't do that. It's funny because I actually this is a rental, so that would be really doubly bad. Because I'm like, sorry, landlord, I kind of lit the room on fire it was for seduction and i'm leaving now so don't worry about that deposit it's fine i, I know you're gonna keep it <laughs> bye, bye. <laughs> i'd like my deposit back <laughs> um anyway that's all i have james um okay let's see so quick update for me i uh we're working on the hypertrophy book audio book uh acx of course is very cunty with their feedback so so scott sent me the files they are of course spec'd to their guidelines and we tried uploading them today and it was like not spec to guidelines and scott and i are both just like are you fucking kidding me what do we have to do to get these files uploaded um, so i'm working on it hopefully that will be done either today or tomorrow and then it goes to review and then next on deck will be dr davis's book uh space habit building and we'll Ooh, cool same process on that Who that's a is dr davis the one that read that I, I read the the text and then Mel did the, um she did like, there's a bunch of worksheets in there about like how to kind of like plan some of the habits and goals and, and behavior changes. And there's little worksheets. So she did the worksheet walkthrough. And then we also did like a little Q and A for about 45 minutes at the end. Super. Yeah. So that one's going to be fun and interesting for you guys. Uh, let's see. I think that's about it for me. And I got nothing as usual. I'm always putting out more YouTube shit. I'm always working a bunch of secret projects. Um, we can't talk about them because 
There's Dr. Dr. Jen Case from RP would kill me if I did. Um, she's, that's actually her job. She's good she's at killing. Kill yeah. Um, that's it, folks. All that's right, it. folks. Make sure you guys subscribe to the RP YouTube. There's all sorts of nonsense coming every week. Uh, and yeah, just stay tuned. We've got all sorts of fun content coming out. So, oh, I, you know, now that I'm seeing my, because <laughs> you uh, canceled out the the screenshot and now I'm seeing my own body like more zoomed in. This is like how like live bear fan pages. <laughs> That's what I was thinking like too. The hair, the pecs. This is terrible. <laughs> this is God. Dr. Isotel's only fans. Stay, stay tuned. We'll link in, link in bio for only fans. Mostly fans. James, real talk. Do you think it would degrade my professional image and bring disrepute to RP if I actually started a almost exclusively gay centered only fans? I don't have any problem with it. I don't know if you've saw you've seen lately, but there's been a couple like high profile case, not high profile, but there's been like there was a police officer and I think there was like a nurse or something and they sure. had an OnlyFans and they What's found out. That? What's wrong with that? Uh do they get canned or no? I I don't remember what the outcome was, but I think they were considering canning, or there was at least like quite a bit of repercussions. You know who has an OnlyFans? Gabby Garcia. Oh, quite a good one. Look at Gabby. <laughs> Only for fan now. Come on. So, yeah, fun fact. Uh, everyone's going to be going on Reddit like, who's got the Gabby leaks? Let me see. <laughs> you know, uh, James, we're not going to. We're going to go offline now to talk more smack, uh, positive smack, about our uh, proclivities for seeing interesting physiques naked. Uh, and, and with that, we leave you until the next bi-weekly webinar that doesn't occur weekly, but is the weekly webinar. That's it. See ya.